This is WEFT Champaign, 90.1 FM, community radio for East Central Illinois, streaming live at www.weft.org. The views and opinions expressed here are those of the speakers and do not necessarily represent those of WFT, its board of directors, associates, its station manager, or Prairie Air Incorporated. The following program is pre-recorded and consists of two parts. The first part was recorded in 2011. The second part was recorded on January 1st, 2016. Welcome to Weekend Heartbeat. I'm Sean David, and this is A New Lamp. New Lamp for Old. New Lamp for Old. Remember how Aladdin headed out to get oil for his mother's old dented tarnished lamp? And in the market, he met a magician calling out these words. This strange man was offering to give him a brand new shiny lamp for his old one. That's what I want to offer you, if you'll have it. A new lamp of spiritual guidance. But maybe you already have such a lamp, which still burns brightly. Great. You are still welcome to join us simply to learn who we are. But maybe your lamp of divine guidance has gotten dented and tarnished like Aladdin's. Or perhaps you have no such lamp at all. To you, I offer a new lamp. Hi, my name is Marilyn. Welcome to A New Lamp, a program designed to make you acquainted with the Baha'i religious faith. I hope you will choose to spend the next few minutes with me. Thanks. Circled in sky 
inside me a universe longing to find Lord of the mountain Good morning again. So last week, we learned that Baha'u'llah and his family were confined in the fall prison town of Akka in the army barracks. He was separated from his people who were ill-treated, some dying in the first days in Akka. Baha'u'llah referred to it as the most great prison. Gradually, conditions relaxed. Over the years, Baha'u'llah wrote many books referred to as tablets, including letters to the heads of states and heads of religions throughout the world with dire warnings. They ignored him, and the predictions proved true. A sad thing occurred while in the prison. One of his sons was on the roof praying and fell through a skylight. Sad as this was, the lad's death opened the doors of the prison, so people who had traveled long distances to see Baha'u'llah were now able to do so. The army had need of the barracks for their men, and so the prisoners were told to find places for themselves to live. A house was found to rent. The years passed, and the local governor had high regard for Baha'u'llah and his followers, now known as Baha'is. He was allowed to move beyond the confines of the town to a home in the country where he could once again enjoy the beauty of nature. An English scholar, Professor E.G. Brown, was allowed to visit Baha'u'llah. Here is what he wrote. My conductor paused for a moment while I removed my shoes. Then with a quick movement of the hand, he withdrew, and as I passed, replaced the curtain. And I found myself in a large apartment along the upper end of which ran a low divan, while on the side opposite to the door were placed two or three chairs. Though I dimly suspected whither I was going and whom I was to behold, for no distinct intimation had been given to me, a second or two elapsed, ere with a throb of wonder and awe, I became definitely conscious that the room was not untenanted. In the corner where the divan met the wall sat a wondrous and venerable figure, crowned with a felt headdress of the kind called Taj by dervishes, but of unusual height and make round the base of which was wound a small white turban. The face of him on whom I gazed I can never forget, though I cannot describe it. Those piercing eyes seemed to read one's very soul. Power and authority sat on that ample brow, while the deep lines on the forehead and face implied an age which the jet-black hair and beard flowing down in indistinguishable luxuriance almost to the waist seemed to belie. No need to ask in whose presence I stood as I bowed myself before one who is the object of a devotion and love which kings might envy and emperors sigh for in vain. A mild, dignified voice bade me be seated and then continued, Praise be to God that thou hast attained. Thou hast come to see a prisoner and an exile. We desire but the good of the world and the happiness of the nations. Yet they deem us a stir up of strife and sedition, worthy of bondage and banishment, that all nations should become one in faith, and all men as brothers, that the bonds of affection and unity between the sons of men should be strengthened, that diversity of religion should cease, and differences of race be annulled. What harm is there in this? Yet so it shall be. These fruitless strifes, these ruinous wars, shall pass away, and the most great peace shall come. Do not you in Europe need this also? Is not this that which Christ foretold? Yet do we see your kings and rulers lavishing their treasures more freely on means for the destruction of the human race than on that which would conduce to the happiness of mankind. These strifes and this bloodshed and discord must cease and all men be as one kindred and one family. Let not a man glory in this, that he loves his country. Let him glory in this, that he loves his kind. At dawn on May 29th, 1892, at the age of 75 years, Baha'u'llah left this earthly life. His son, Abdu'l-Baha, sent a message to the Sultan, who for so many years had kept him exiled, with this message. 
the sun of Baha has set. My servant, purge thy heart from malice and innocent of envy, enter the divine court of holiness.
Thanks so much for being with me this morning. I hope you have found a blessing during these few minutes. If you want to learn more about the Baha'i religion, you can go online to www.bahai.us. To contact me, my email address is a new lamp at yahoo.com. Thanks and have a great day. Welcome to the first New Lamp program for this new year, 2016. We are pleased to have as our guests today, Nora and Taman Green, uh, Baha'is from Danville. Welcome to you both. Oh, thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Nora. Hey, Taman. Hey. Hi, Sean. We don't get to uh, see you folks too often, so we're pleased that you were willing to come this distance to be with us today. Uh, we like our listeners to know a little bit about our guests. So how about each of you giving us just a little biography, uh, such as family background, schooling, uh, work, whatever you think that the folks might be interested in knowing about you. Nora, would you like to start? Sure. Um, I was raised in the suburbs of Chicago. My parents were both teachers. Um, I was raised Catholic. Um, big Catholic family. Uh huh. Um, went to the University of Illinois, so have lived in Champaign Urbana for many years, and now we've been in Danville for ten years. Um, and I um, used to teach in Oakwood. So Did I, you? I really like the Central Illinois area. It's uh, been home for a long time. At uh, what age level were you teaching? I taught eighth grade history. And then I went back to school and got a master's in public health from Northern Illinois University. Wow. So I came back to Danville. So. Okay. Mm-hmm. Great. I worked in um, drug treatment for several years, done a lot of grant writing and uh, youth ah. development. Okay. You've been a busy lady. Mm-hmm. How about you, Taman? Um, to give you a little family background, um, my great-grandfather was a sharecropper in Mississippi back in the 50s uh, and like a lot of families at that time uh, migrated to Chicago uh, Mm. and eventually settled in the west side of Chicago Uh, and so um, I'm from originally from the west side of Chicago west suburbs of Chicago Um, I have a master's in English education from Northern Illinois University and I teach high school English in Georgetown, uh, which is a small town just outside of Danville. Oh, I was going to say, I've not been in this general area long enough to, I didn't know where Georgetown was. Mm-hmm. Okay, so basically you guys were both in Chicago. Mm-hmm. Is that where you met then? Yeah, that's kind of interesting. We, we <coughs> both uh, attended U of I. Mm-hmm. Uh, lived in the uh, Urbana-Champaign area, very nearby each other. Didn't meet down here. Uh, both of us moved back up to Chicagoland area, and that's where we met. Ah, isn't that interesting? Always yeah. neat to hear where people met. Yeah, and then we moved back down here. We've been mm-hmm. married for 13 years. So. Mm-hmm. That's great. So, um... We have found it interesting that as we speak to different Baha'is, there are so many variations in our Baha'i histories. Uh, Sean has been a Baha'i like forever, (laughs) and and I didn't find the faith until I was 70 years old. Uh, What is your Baha'i history? Either one of you. I was raised Catholic right, and found that I loved Christ teachings, mm-hmm. but struggled with there were no female priests, mm-hmm. among other things. 
Um, and then I actually was an atheist for several years. Mm-hmm. And I became a foster parent in my early 20s. Um, while living in Champaign, and when you when you become a, a foster parent at a young age of teenagers, you find yourself doing a lot of praying. Um, <laughs> and so I was praying to hopefully God, and at that point I realized that I needed um, to find a faith that I felt comfortable raising a child in. That's mm-hmm. what began my search. I wasn't sure what I was looking for. Um, except that I felt that it was very important to raise a child with a clear sense of um, being a spiritual person and bringing good to the world. Mm -hmm. Because so many kids that end up in the foster care system are there because of um, misguided priorities. Yes. um, And mistakes often lead to addiction, and addiction leads to... Um, a parent being unable to parent. So right. I, that's what draw me to looking for a faith to raise a child in. So mm-hmm. I actually told friends I was church shopping, <laughs> but I didn't set foot in any church. <laughs> Instead, I found myself at Barnes & Noble bookstore by Marketplace Mall and was um, looking on the shelves, and I had never heard of the Baha'i Faith, and I found a book, Introduction really? to the Baha'i Faith by Joseph Shepard. Wow. And I sat down and I read. It's very short, you mm-hmm. know, which when you're working full time and you have foster children, you don't have much time. So luckily, Introduction to the Baha'i Faith by Joseph Shepard was very short, maybe 60 pages. <laughs> and I think I read the whole thing cover to cover that night. And at that point, I pretty quickly realized that the same voice that I heard in church that voice of God through Christ was the same voice that I recognized in the prayers and the writings in the book. Yes. And that led me to read more, find mm-hmm. more. Um, and eventually that led me to the Urbana Baha'i Center. Um, okay. I was surprised that there were real people in <laughs> Urbana that were Baha'i. And so this book that was on the shelf at Barnes & Noble's led me to real human beings. Um, and so that, that, that was my journey. And it, it still took several years after that. Um, I was reluctant to be a member of something, mm-hmm. having been an atheist for several years. But I eventually realized that um, progress, to have true progress and and God's intention is for human beings to progress. We, we have to be united in our vision of what that progress is to be. Mm-hmm. And so um, I did reach the point after some divine intervention that I became a Baha'i. So, and that's been 14, 15 years ago now. That's wonderful. You know, I it's suspicion that a lot of people, uh, whatever their faith, it's like um, they get into the teen years, the early 20s, and tend to quest, start questioning their faith. But it, when these children come along, it's all of a sudden, how do we want to raise these children? These children are important. And I think a lot of people start taking a second look mm-hmm. at what they believe at that point. Right. Come on. Well, um my family's uh, uh, Baptist, uh, and uh, when I got to college, I started to have an ongoing investigation of just philosophy and religion. I, I just wanted to know. Uh, I think maybe I had the idea that when I had a child that I wanted to be a father who was knowledgeable and could p- pass on the, that knowledge to my kids. That you know, uh, when they had questions, they could come to me and I would have some answers. So, mm-hmm. you know, uh, I did a lot of you know research and I went to a lot of churches and you know mosques and <laughs> mm-hmm. and what have you. And yeah. um, 
and I read, you know, the Bible all the way through, the Quran all the way through. I, uh, and I found myself at Eastern Illinois University, and I was in the stacks, when you can go there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I found an, uh, a little book called uh, Wine of Astonishment. Oh. By uh, Bill Sears, and uh, uh, he used to be a radio personality, and became a hand of, a co- of the cause. Uh, right. And uh, and uh, I read that book, and it was uh, about a it was fictional uh, a a Jew, a Christian, and a Muslim having lunch in Israel, discussing their different perspectives, and a mm-hmm. Baha'i mm-hmm. having a dif- uh, a discussion about their different perspectives. And I found that the Baha'i had the same uh, answers I had came up with and went even further. And so I was like, oh, I need to investigate this a little Mm -hmm. bit. And so I started pulling out old dusty books with Arabic (laughs) on the covers and people were like, is is that for a class? No, this is enjoyment. (laughs) What's wrong with this? (laughs) Right, and so, uh, after graduation, there was I, I did not encounter any Baha'is while I was uh, in Charleston, and uh, after graduating, I moved back to Urbana area and and uh, and connected with the Baha'is here. Mm-hmm. So, wow! And became a Baha'i in '99, beginning of '99. So oh, actually, did... it was a Valentine's Day of '99. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, most of us remember our anniversary, Baha'i anniversary <laughs> dates, don't we? So so you each became Baha'i on your own before you met? I had not yet become a Baha'i. Okay. Um, the same year that Taman moved back to Urbana, that year I had already moved to Chicago. So I had been to the Baha'i Center and met a number of Baha'is, came here mm-hmm. several times, went to some great potlucks. <laughs> and then I moved to Chicago. So then when he moved back to Urbana, we never met. So what's interesting is when we planned our wedding, we knew the same people from <laughs> the Urbana Baha'i Center, but never met them together. <laughs> uh, it sounds like you were just crisscrossing. We, we, we decided yes. that we have an arranged marriage and got a sense of humor. <laughs> sure. So... When we met in the Chicago area, Mm -hmm. Taman was back in school to become a teacher. He already had his bachelor's and was working towards his master's degree. Okay. Um, I was uh, working full-time at the time, and I had not yet become a Baha'i, but I had already decided that if there was any religion or faith that I was going to become or join, Mm -hmm. it was the Baha'i faith. Uh, Mm -hmm. I just hadn't made that final commitment so yeah when I met Taman he said oh by the way I'm a Baha'i do you know what that is and I said well yes I do <laughs> which shocked him I might add um, because most it, the Baha'i faith today is where Christianity was you know 200 years after Christ's death right. so we are small but mighty and growing but emphasis on small right now so it was um, a shock to him that not only did I know what the Baha'i faith was, but I'd read several of the writings, mm-hmm. um, was very familiar with it, and we attended, um, Aurora had a Baha'i school on Sundays. <laughs> ah, okay. Um, in the home of a couple that was an American, um, Persian. he was an American engineer mm-hmm. and worked in telecommunications, and she was... Um, from Iran originally and okay. had um, emigrated here with her family. Mm-hmm. So they hosted uh, Baha'i school and really great dinners with Persian food. Mm-hmm. And that's mm-hmm. where yes. I think it was maybe a month after we got married where I signed the declaration and officially was a member of the Baha'i faith. Wow, that's so, great. So the process of becoming a Baha'i is an interesting one if, if you're not a Baha'i, which I wasn't a Baha'i. So I was really mm-hmm. kind of, well, how do I do this? <laughs> um, and I'm at Baha'i school, and it was a Sunday. I said, Carl, I, I want to become a Baha'i today. Well, he said, oh, and he disappeared. 
You were expecting to be baptized or something? I don't know what I was well, expecting. I, don't know. I, I didn't expect him to disappear. So he um, he had gone upstairs and he'd gotten um, their small cards, mm-hmm. they looked like a business card, and he brought them downstairs and he handed me um, the card and he said, "By the way, this is a Bill Sears card." Oh. So um, hmm. he had met Bill Sears, who in the Baha'i faith would be very similar to. Um, perhaps, uh, I think, in Catholic terms. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, you'll have right. to help me out here, but... Um, a saint? It would be the equivalent of perhaps something similar a bishop to a something. bishop. Yeah. yeah. Right, yeah. or a cardinal. Right. So a learned person. Yeah, so uh, the, the funny story behind this is the second book I read about the Baha'i faith was God Loves Laughter by Bill Sears. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I had taken the book with me to the train station in Chicago, and I was reading God Loves Laughter by Bill Sears and struggling with becoming a Baha'i, considering my past history. And a young man sat down next to me, and he said, Excuse me, what are you reading? And I said, God Loves Laughter by Bill Sears. And he showed me his book, which was Wine of Astonishment. (laughs) Oh, no! (laughs) <laughs> and I just started laughing because, you know, Chicago is 11 million some odd people. Yes, uh-huh. And I had just had the thought, you know, I really believe that I'm hearing the voice of God, that this is that same voice that I heard in church. Yes. And that the message is what the world needs for today. But I'm just not sure. I mean, you, know. <laughs> you want clarity? <laughs> you're, you know, you question it. You know, our, in our culture, you question everything and re-question it, and you know, so mm-hmm. um, so I could not help but do a lot of laughing <laughs> that God had put me on a bench with a young man who was reading Wine of Astonishment by Bill Sears, which was the first book yes. that Taman had read. Um, and he, Taman, had given me that book to read along with a friend of ours. Mm-hmm. Um, they both sort of jointly gave me the book to read. So um, that's my funny story. So at that Baha'i is school, funny. At, yes, at the <laughs> high school, um, he brought me the card to sign, and he didn't know the story. Mm-hmm. And he handed me this little card to sign. He said, oh, by the way, I met Bill Sears in person. And he gave me these cards, and this is the first one I'm giving to someone to sign. <laughs> and so that was my confirmation from the Holy Spirit that this was indeed a faith from from heaven. And I, I had no more qualms about signing anything. I <laughs> haven't had any sense, I might add. So. Oh, isn't that it's a neat story. Both of you were drawn in by Bill Sears, and then... Yeah, that whole thing, that like say that confirmation. In our arranged marriage. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, not literally, mind you, but you right. know, spiritually, it seems spiritually to have been arranged. Or spiritually prearranged, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, that is so, that is just really neat. I just love to hear these stories that people tell us about how they became Baha'is. Uh, so, uh, you folks are a mixed couple. Has that ever been a problem for you, or have you been accepted pretty well in that? No, it's not been a problem. Well, except that my parents didn't want us to get married. Well, <laughs> a slight problem. Mm-hmm. Well, I I knew there might be they a were, slight hiccup there, but I thought it was going to be something that could be easily, well, eventually overcome. It so, was, and but, it was. My parents were worried. I mean, they uh-huh. loved Taman. They were not concerned about him being black and me being white. Uh-huh. It helped that he was an English teacher, and of course, my parents were teachers. Right. But um, they, they, they were born in the 1920s. Guess who's coming for dinner? Huh? Yes, oh. that's exactly <laughs> what my mother said. Guess who's coming to dinner? And they were concerned that we would have problems. Yes. Um, so initially, they said, "No, please don't get married," um, and I was very upset. Mm-hmm. Taman said, have faith, have some patience. And I'd say about three weeks later, they changed their minds and oh, really? supported the marriage. So, My parents were concerned also, being from Mississippi themselves. Mm-hmm. There's some history there of intolerance. And they were concerned, but uh, they figure out I knew what I was doing. That's or right. I figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know as a parent that would 
be my concern is what kind of trouble are you walking into? What kind of problems are your children going to face? But apparently, uh, once you got past that parental hurdle, uh, it was okay. Right. We we really haven't had any issues. I, I think maybe a, a look here and there, maybe, but no no real issues. I think Danville was the perfect place for us to sell down in because, uh, I mean, it's amazing how many mixed children, mixed couples are in Danville. Uh, Danville has been integrated for, for quite some time now. Mm -hmm. it's, so it's not unusual. It's becoming much more acceptable. Right. That's great. You would think since it's 2016. Now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. So you folks have done a lot of working with young people and children, right? Uh, both as teachers and in uh, your private lives. Uh, you want to talk to us a little bit about this and and how your Baha'i faith has inspired and impacted this type of work? Uh, when we were in Aurora, we had uh, been through the core uh, activities such as uh, all the Ruhi books at the time and... Mm -hmm. and uh, uh, worked with the junior youth, and we kind of refer to our time there as Baha'i Boot Camp. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Finally. Because, I mean, we were really immersed, and it was great, you know. I mean, uh, we were the teachers uh, on Sunday. We we were the junior youth uh, coordinators there. We, and then we also did uh, Heartland Summer School. Mm -hmm. teachers we, we, were, we were Heartland Summer School teachers so we had a, a lot of experience working with kids you know early on and I mean in teaching you learn uh, whatever concept even more in depthly so sure. it, it, was, it was a great way to learn too. I started working with kids right after college uh, my, I had a, a good friend of mine in high school we were freshmen, and she actually ran away from home due mm. to being abused and was murdered the next day. Oh, my mm. gosh. So, it, and it had a huge impact on, you know, all of us um, because we'd gone through grade school together, mm -hmm. and she was brilliant. She was brilliant. In fact, she, at the time she ran away, she was a straight-A student. She'd packed all her homework to do. Um in spite of her bad family background. Instead of, you know, her mom was a single parent and I think just frustrated mm -hmm. um, by a lot of stress sure. that was going on. Um, when I graduated from college, my first husband and I, who has since passed away from cancer, we decided to become foster parents. And a lot of that motivation was realizing that um, my friend at the time needed somewhere safe to go and there mm -hmm. wasn't a place she could go. So... We were very young. We just gotten married, and we were given a teenage foster son. Ah, which is what I mentioned, I think, earlier about praying. Yes, mm -hmm. not not lots that much younger prayers. than yourself. No, lots of prayers, and it um, <coughs> what finding the Baha'i faith gave the spiritual support mm -hmm. that's needed in working with today's kids. Because when you work in drug treatment, what, what becomes very apparent is that addiction to alcohol and addiction to drugs is far more likely to happen when someone um, has had a difficult childhood. Mm -hmm. And it's also harder for that person to recover from addiction when they have had a very stressful and difficult childhood and are dealing with a lot of grief and loss. Yes. Um, and so what the Baha'i faith helped me to do was Baha'u'llah's message that alcohol is just a chemical, mm -hmm. but human, us human beings, were not designed to handle it safely. Um, and we're also not meant to do drugs. It, it affects us spiritually. In addition to the addictive aspect of them, it changes who we are. It prevents us from growing and developing, and we can be maybe 25 years old chronologically, but if we've been addicted to drugs since 15, we're really stuck at 15. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think 
being a part of a faith and feeling confident that God's teachings speak to today's needs and that alcohol and drugs are not okay, that, that was very helpful to me. Mm-hmm. Because when you're trying to help a child navigate becoming an adult in today's culture, if it's gray, well, you can drink, but just don't let it become a problem. Mm. Well, maybe, you know, some drugs shouldn't be illegal, for example. Mm-hmm. Some drugs aren't that bad, you know, so just be careful. Right. And with, with the... We are biological states. beings. Yes. I mean, that's our reality. We're biological beings. And um, that's a risky proposition. Mm-hmm. And we've been a cultural experiment. And the cultural experiment has resulted in thousands upon thousands of children coming into the foster care system. And the grief and the loss that they face from losing their family, it's not fixable. And it never goes away. And so finding the... Baha'i faith, it solidified for me that it's okay to have a message for children that says you can be a part of the world. You can have friends and be friendly and you can achieve your goals, but it's also 100% okay not to participate and do the things that are currently common in our culture, Uh very counterproductive to your own personal growth and development, and ultimately are very risky um, for your entire life. And others. Right. And like you said, it, 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 it creates this gray when we have states that are legalizing some of these things, uh, and, and adults, uh, are, doing them so openly mm. yes how how are children to get examples and uh, I know there's a situation that was in my family that turned out tragically mm-hmm. uh, with alcohol and drugs and right. and yes it's it's one of these things we really can't compromise with to say to somebody oh you maybe just take an occasional drink or maybe you happen to be the person who body literally cannot handle the first drink, right. let alone the second or third drink. Right. And, uh, and I, w- I grew up in an Irish Catholic family. <laughs> and, you know, and so um, it was helpful finding spiritual teachings mm-hmm. that helped solidify um, my, my own personal um, detachment from our current alcohol and drug culture, but then also in working with youth Yes. You know, there there are a lot of kids who, they're not comfortable with it. They really don't necessarily want to do it, but when everybody's doing it, it seems mm-hmm. like the thing to do. And so when you're, as an adult, when you can say, I'm a fun person to be around, I have a good time, we have a good life, we do interesting things, mm-hmm. but we're also adults who don't drink or use drugs, mm-hmm. that's huge for kids. Absolutely. Because... We're predictable. <laughs> we are, you know, Taman and I, you know, in working with, with, with kids we've worked with, when, um, even with our own son, and we, um, we're we very predictable because we're always the same people. <laughs> right. When you add in drugs or alcohol, then a, a child gets very inconsistent mm-hmm. parenting and inconsistent messages, and um, one day things are, you can go ahead and do it. It's permitted in the next it's not permitted and maybe the parent doesn't even necessarily remember um, Mm -hmm. what they allow their child to do the day before so um, consistent consistent parents available Mm -hmm. and reliable because even parents that are addicted to alcohol and drugs love their kids but the chemical makes good parenting an impossibility right and so knowing that there's there's some youth that we've worked with who won't have to fight that battle mm-hmm. is is a blessing. Yes, and they in turn are gonna you know be examples in their neighborhoods and in right. their families that hey I can have a great life and do wonderful awesome things and have friends and have a good time, but I don't have to um, partake mm-hmm. necessarily. And I think getting just through getting through the peer pressure time right. and knowing that they've got the support of parents who are 
able to help them through that time. Right. It 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 was life changing. I think finding the Baha'i faith was life changing in so many ways, but it's also enabled us to um, really help some kids who were at a crossroads and at a turning point in their life, and they could have gone down a path um, of addiction Mm -hmm. um, or dealing, and instead they've gone down a path of not being, not using, not drinking, not being addicted, and have jobs and are going to college. And so that's, that's the... The blessing of faith and Mm -hmm. spirituality is it's transformative. It's personally transformative, and then it also transforms neighborhoods, families, ultimately the world. Yes, one person at a time. My goodness, that that must have been so satisfying for you to see these young people growing up to be uh, stable and uh, emotionally, mentally healthy. That's wonderful. And they're going to be good parents. Yes. That's a neat part of it, is, is seeing that cycle's broken. Mm-hmm. I guess that'd be a good way to put it, just because it is cyclic. You certainly go through one generation after another, unless there's something specific to cut that off. Yeah. Did you have something, John? Well, just that it kind of resonates with me. You know, in the Army, it seemed like everybody drank, and uh, it just was like the thing that you did that you didn't even think about. And so... Being someone in the army who didn't drink, I kind of, you know, that reaction of not just, well, why don't you want to drink? But it's just, you can, you can not drink. That's a thing. It was very surprising for a lot of people to even have that presented to them as an option. So when I, when I think about, you know, the kids I grew up with too, with parents, when sort of the similar situations that you just described, that just resonates with me. It's like just presenting it as an option uh, can make such a huge difference. Yes, Mm -hmm. and more and more it just seems like our whole society anymore. Drink is always a part of everything, Mm -hmm. and it's, uh, you know, distressing, whether it's watching a a food program on TV or just, you know, there's always something that's being uh, taken in that is not healthy. The music, you know, Mm -hmm. the whole uh, society. Yeah. So... um, are you working with uh, any particular youth groups at this time? <laughs> We're not. We have a two-year-old son. <laughs> that's, that, that, that's a youth group He's right there. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, we we used to have a, we had four a 4-H H. club for mm-hmm. a while, so we've taken a break. And mm-hmm. um, when he's a little bit older, I'm sure we will be oh, back sure. doing more things with kids. Sure. Can Can you tell us a little bit about what the 4-H group was uh, was like? I was in 4-H when I was a kid, even though I grew up in a Chicago suburb. Um, you can do quite a lot with 4-H, absent farm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was too for a little time. And so we, uh, when we first moved to Danville, we noticed that there were quite a few kids in the neighborhood that were very bored, um, particularly some boys who had, you know, were uh, launching rocks from one side of the street to the other uh, mm-hmm. because they apparently could not think of anything else to do. <laughs> <laughs> the heights of boredom. <laughs> yes. So uh, to, I said to Taman, I said, we have to do something. <laughs> and that desire to do something for, for the bored kids on the block um, resulted in a 4-H club. Mm-hmm. Um, we, the kids, we met maybe a couple times a month. Um, and what was really neat was watching the kids learn to set goals and to reach those goals. Some of them were siblings. Mm -hmm. So if you can imagine um, 12 kids at a table and their siblings, and they're supposed to plan a winter party together. Uh Um, As most people have siblings or cousins, um, the idea of kids being able to effectively plan anything without hurting each other can be (laughs) a stretch. And so one of the one of the key aspects of the Baha'i faith is the process of consultation um, and that it's imperative for, for us people to learn how to consult with each other and not insult each other. Uh, <laughs> well, that's a good way to put it. 
And so the so 4H um, actually teaches kids how to do the process of consultation mm -hmm. um, and reach decisions and follow through on those decisions. And so we um, we help the kids learn that process and they learned it and they mastered it and um, I don't know about mastered it, but they got exponentially better at it mm -hmm. and they had fun. I mean, they hosted a winter party for the block. They did some projects. Um, mm -hmm. We did tons of baking. Hmm, sure. One of the young women became an expert at cupcakes <laughs> <laughs> and muffins. Um, and she is now a junior at Southern Illinois University and wants to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. So it was fun. It was a lot of fun. And that uh, teaching consultation, that's something they will have all their lives. Right. They yeah. will have that all their lives. That, you know, especially the aspect um, in the Baha'i faith that it's okay if your idea is not embraced by the group. Mm -hmm. um, the purpose is to have a unified vision and then you can do great things. Right. Um, and so we really encourage the kids that, you know, you, you had some really good ideas and maybe next time the group will agree to do some of your ideas, but this time they didn't and that's okay because we're going to have a great, you're going to have a great party. Mm -hmm. um, and it, you know, that's, that's a hard thing for kids to handle. Yes. But they did. You, you know, one of the, one of the key, the key things about the Baha'i faith, any faith, it's that it's imperative for us to work with kids. They're the future. That's right. So, it, you know, it's easy today to find something on television to watch or go, you know, be addicted to something, mm -hmm. even if it's just Facebook <laughs> or movies or, or what have you. But um, I, think if, I think if more people looked around their own neighborhoods and said, hey, I can do something for my neighborhood. I can start a youth group through any type of youth program. There's mm -hmm. tons of them out there, 4-H, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts. Um, you can go to the Boys and Girls Club and volunteering here. Volunteering mm -hmm. at the Boys and Girls Club. Um, you know, you can change, you can, you can change the direction of, of some kids in your own neighborhood or board and sure. um, have never had that experience of being in something where they learn some skills in terms of community leadership. Mm -hmm. And that's critical today. You know, all communities are struggling with the fact that it's not easy for kids to find jobs. That's right. And so it used to be if you were 15, 16, you'd find a job. And suddenly you had plenty to do. Mm -hmm. Kids today, they don't have that benefit that we had. And so if we aren't um, giving them direction, if we, the community, are not giving them direction and giving them meaningful things to do, then they find direction in things that are not helpful to them or or the neighborhood. Sure. I, I remember one of our, the young men started his own landscaping company mm -hmm. through 4-H. That was one of his projects. Oh, really? You know, yeah. he had his own cars and, and everything. It was, it, was, it was great. I mean, but, I mean, that goes back to what Nora is saying. You know, they don't have the opportunity maybe to... Uh, be employed by an employer at 15 mm -hmm. or 16 but you know uh, if you teach them how to be uh, self-sufficient you know be leaders in their own right they you know they can do things like that right you know mm -hmm. well this has been great uh, Nora and Taman we're going to take a uh, look at some things that have come up at the Baha Center um, over this next month on Saturday, January 21st at 1 to 3 p.m. at the Baha'i Center in Urbana, there will be a cluster reflection meeting. A cluster reflection meeting is a gathering where Baha'is and members of the wider community can come together to share their insights from the past few months and make future plans concerning the improvement of our neighborhoods and society. On Tuesday evenings at 7 o'clock, there is a prayer and meditation meeting led by Joan Mills. Each Sunday morning at 10.30, there is a regular devotional program that includes Baha'i and other religious scriptural prayers and readings, and oftentimes music. 
on the fourth Sunday of each month. The devotional program at 10.30 will be followed by a potluck lunch at noon and game day, an afternoon for family-friendly fun and games for all ages. The Baha'i Center is located at 807 East Green Street in Urbana, a couple blocks east of Lincoln Square. It is located on the Red Bus Line and it is wheelchair accessible. Very good. Nora and Taman Green, we have been delighted to have you today. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you for all that you do with the young people, both Baha'i young people and the peoples in the neighborhoods, and uh, presenting a wonderful Baha'i testimony. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks thank for you. having us. Yes, yes, thank you. Good to be here. Okay, so we're ready to read some of the Baha'i writings. Will you folks join us in this? Absolutely. Sure. Okay. We're here. In the name of the Sovereign Lord, the Lord of power, glorified is he before whom all the dwellers of the earth and heaven bow down in adoration and unto whom all men turn in supplication. He is the one who holdeth in his grasp the mighty kingdom of all created things and unto him shall all return. He is the one who revealeth whatsoever he willeth and by his injunction, be thou, all things have come into being. So powerful is the light of unity that it can illuminate the whole earth. The one true God, he who knoweth all things, himself testifieth to the truth of these words. This goal excelleth every other goal, and this aspiration is the monarch of all aspirations. Baha'u'llah. The heavenly books, the Bible, the Quran, and the other holy writings have been given by God as guides into the path of divine virtue, love, justice, and peace. Abdu'l-Baha. Fighting and an employment of force, even for the right cause, will not bring about good results. The oppressed who have right on their side must not take the right by force. The evil would continue. Hearts must be changed. Abdul Baha. There can be no doubt, whatever, that the peoples of the world, of whatever race or religion, derive their inspiration from one heavenly source and are the subjects of one God. Baha'u'llah. <laughs> To find out more about Baha'i events taking place in Champaign-Urbana, or if you'd like to listen to previous New Lamp programs, you can go online to www.cu-bahai.org. Or if you would like to learn more about the Baha'i national and international community, go to www.bahai.us. Thank you again for joining us today. I hope you'll join us again next month. Goodbye. Thanks for listening to this week's Weekend Heartbeat on WEFT Champaign 90.1 FM, Community Radio, Champaign, Urbana, Illinois, streaming live at www.weft.org.